We'll start with an overview that's partly a review of basic concepts and partly a guide to how we're going to approach the course. You can see it's a frequentist introduction, which implies there must be a Bayesian introduction too. I'd say the field of statistics is about 90% frequentist and 10% Bayesian, and this means you're more likely to be familiar with the frequentist approach more than the Bayesian approach, so we'll wait for the Bayesian part until we meet in person so that we can actually discuss it. If you'd like some background material on a, a sort of introduction to the field, you, it's optional, but you could look at chapter one of Davison's book. The goal of statistical analysis, well, what we want to do is to draw reasonable com conclusions from noisy numerical data. Uh, the reasonable part is going to be defined uh, fairly technically in terms of unbiased estimation and uh, powerful tests and all that stuff. The noisy part implies that there is a probability model somewhere, and of course we're dealing with numbers. Here is one approach, uh, my approach, to um, the process of statistical analysis, a way of breaking down the whole process. So you start with a fairly realistic example or problem in the real world, and then you decide on a statistical model for that uh, process or problem. And maybe you decide the sample size, perhaps you decide the sample size because perhaps the data have already been collected and you don't have any choice, you're just going to analyze what, what's there. But if you have a chance to decide on this sample size, please uh, take advantage of it. Um, you acquire the data somehow, which might mean um, actually collecting it, like maybe writing a script to go online and collect data, or it could be that some scientist will hand you a um, USB key with a spreadsheet on it, and the spreadsheet will have the data. Um, so you first examine and clean the data, generate displays, descriptive statistics, and so on, just to see what's going on. And then you estimate the model parameters, maybe by maximum likelihood, maybe by some other method. This is frequentist, right? Uh, we'll get to the Bayesian approach, uh, the Bayesian equivalent later. Um, and then you carry out tests and compute confidence intervals, or both. Uh, and then maybe, based on this, you reconsider the model. You might go back to the estimation phase. And eventually, based on the results of the estimation and inference, you draw conclusions about the example or problem. And now notice how this whole thing starts out with real data and then goes off into another world, the world of the statistical model, which tends to be formal and mathematical, and then eventually comes back to the original problem and the estimates and conclusions that you draw from the statistical analysis will formally be about parameters of the model, but your job is to translate it back out into something that makes sense in terms of the original problem. And this whole course, I think the field of applied statistics in general, is about navigating the interface between these two worlds, this world of abstraction, the abstract statistical model, which you have to have pretty good control of, and the substance matter, the actual experiment, marketing problem, whatever it is, you have to understand them both. And what I hope to do in this course is to go relatively deeply into both worlds and tie them, help tie them together, because that's what applied statistics does. Um, so, what's a statistical model? In any problem, you should be able to state it. Uh, here's my definition. A statistical model is a set of assertions that partly specify the probability distribution of the observable data. And the specification may be direct or indirect. Um, here's what I mean. Here's a, by an example. Here's one. Hmm, x1 through xn is a random sample from a normal distribution with expected value mu and variance sigma squared. Okay. Notice that this is a direct specification of a probability distribution for the observable data. An indirect one will come next. And that the, however, this specification of the distribution is only partial. It partly specifies the probability distribution because it leaves the parameters mu and sigma squared unknown 
and to be determined or guessed at from the data. The parameters mu and sigma squared are, are unknown in this. Here's another example that also should be familiar. Oh yeah, i equals 1 to n, let yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2, and so on plus epsilon i. Yeah, this is a regular old regression model. Beta 0 through beta p minus 1 are unknown constants. Um, the xij's are in this model are known constants because they're observable, and we'll get into that later. The epsilon 1 through epsilon n are independent normal random variables that you can't see. Sigma squared is another unknown constant, and y1 through yn, the response variable values, are uh, observable random variables. Yeah, we'll use the word um, explanatory variables for the uh, x variables and response variable for the y variables in regression and regression-like analyses. Um, sometimes the x's are called independent variables, uh, but when the x's are random variables, then you'll say that they might be statistically independent or they might not be, and so then you're going to be in the odd position if you stick with the independent variable terminology of saying, well, that my independent variables might not actually be independent. Oh dear. So we're not going to go there, and so we'll call them explanatory and response variables. The parameters in this model are beta 0 through beta p minus 1 uh, and sigma squared, and they're, and they're unknown. The idea here is that if you knew especially the betas, especially beta 1 through beta p minus 1, why p minus 1? Uh, so the x matrix can be n by p, so, uh, so the notation is easier when we talk in matrix terms. But the idea is that these these x1, xi1 for subject i, or respondent i through x, uh, x uh, p minus 1 are bits of information that you have about the objects, the, uh, the sampling units in the study, and you'd like to uh, predict or see their connection to y, the response variable. And under this model, if beta 1 is 0, then that's the only way that x1 appears in the model at all. That's the only way that x is connected to y at all. So the parameters beta 1 through beta p minus 1 are critical because they determine the connection between the explanatory, potential explanatory variables and the response variable. The model might not be quite right, but the idea of using these regression coefficients as unknown parameters to represent the relationship between the x's and the y's. And if the betas are zero, then there's no influence or connection of that x to the y. And if it's positive, it means one thing. And if beta j is negative, it means another thing. In this way, the unknown parameters correspond to something that's important about the problem, the real-world subject matter to which this is applied. Anyway, a statistical model is a set of assertions that partly specify the probability distribution of the data that we can observe. Uh, the model, then, is, is the, a statistical model the same as the, as the truth? Of course not. In fact, there's a famous quote here that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. I believe this is in a book uh, it's Box and Draper. I did finally track this quote down. And it's a book of uh, something like um, uh, Response Surfaces or something like that. Let's see, what is it? Uh, oh, man, this is a long pause. Sorry about this long pause in the uh, empirical model building and response surfaces. Sorry about the long pause, folks, but this lecture has got to be one take. That's the way my software works. Um, the parameter space. The parameter space is a set of values that can be taken on by the parameter so that, for example, in the normal random sample um, example that we saw before, the parameter space is the set of mu and sigma squared such that mu is between minus and plus infinity and sigma squared is greater than zero. Um, for the regression model, the parameter space is a set of betas and sigma squared such that each beta j is just any real number and sigma squared is bigger than zero. So these, uh, these are the 
permissible set of values that the parameters might have under the model. Here's an example. We'll pursue this elementary example um, all the way. And this is one of the advantages of having overheads instead of writing stuff on the board because this would be painful if I were to write it in my own handwriting. So a fast food chain is considering a change uh, in the blend of coffee beans they use to make the coffee. To determine whether their customers prefer the new blend, the company plans to select a random sample of N equals 100 coffee drinking customers and ask them to taste the coffee made with the new blend and with the old blend in cups marked A and B. And of course, half the time the new blend will be in cup A and half the time it will be in cup B. And the people administering the test aren't going to know which one. And management wants to know if there's a difference in preference for the two blends. This is a fairly standard taste test. Um, here's a statistical model for it. Let theta de denote the probability that a consumer will choose, a randomly chosen consumer will choose the new blend. It actually corresponds to the population proportion of consumers who would choose the new blend. And um, treat the data y1 through yn as a random sample from a Bernoulli distribution. So uh, independently for i equals 1 to n, we have the usual um, Bernoulli probability mass function. Uh, where the yi's are all equal 0 and 1. And if yi equals 0, then this uh, theta to the yi is something to the 0 power and it's 1. And it's 1 minus theta to the, the probability of it is 1 minus theta to the power 1. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, and that would mean that, that the probability that that happens by random selection is 1 minus theta, and so on. Um, the parameter space is the interval from 0 to 1, right? because that's where the thetas live. Um, theta could be estimated by maximum likelihood. And there are large sample tests and confidence intervals. And uh, we live happily ever after. Notice also, just as a sidelight, that if you added up the yi's, you'd get the number of consumers who chose the new blend. And that's uh, got a binomial distribution with parameters n and theta. And so you could take this whole experiment and think of it as a n equals 1 sample from a binomial distribution with parameter n, which is known, and theta, which is unknown. Either way, we'd get the same results. Um, here's a sample homework problem, um, or, and uh, uh, also a sample midterm and final exam program. Find a maximum likelihood estimate of theta. Show your work. So you're, you're de denoting the likelihood by capital L of theta and the log likelihood by a script L uh, you maximize the log likelihood. Um, you do differentiate the log likelihood, because it's easier with respect to theta. And that is the derivative of the log of the likelihood function. And this likelihood function is just the product of the probability mass functions evaluated at the observed data and considered as a function of theta. And log, L-O-G, always refers to the natural log, ln, from now on forever. And so substituting then the likelihood function, the, the probability mass function that we had before, um, and then simplifying a little bit with uh, rules that I hope you recall, um, we'll uh, then take the log of that, differentiate it, and get this. Um, uh, by straightforward calculation, then you set it to zero and solve for theta. That's the way maximum likelihood uh, goes. Yeah, you s we set the derivative to theta and solve, and we get theta equals the sum of yi over n, which is y bar. And y bar, since those yi's are ones for yes and zero for no, that y bar is actually a sample proportion. Um, that's the proportion of people in the sample who chose the new blend of coffee, a very reasonable, as well as the maximum likelihood estimate of the proportion of people in the population who chose the new coffee, or who would have chosen the co new coffee. Of course, when the derivative is 0, you might have a maximum, you might have a minimum, you might have a saddle point. So you can do the second derivative test. And when you do so, uh, you find that it's negative, that the second derivative is negative, meaning that the uh, function is concave down, and it's a maximum, and so everything is fine. Uh, yeah, and the MLE is the sample proportion. Um, we'll call it theta hat. It's the same as y bar, and often denoted by p, unless p is used uh, where I've used theta. Um, a numerical estimate. 
Suppose that 60 of the 100 consumers prefer the new blend. Give a point estimate of the parameter theta. Your answer is a number. Well, okay. Um, sometime, this is the way I typically state questions, and it's helpful to have a number. We, we'll do it with R. Um, assuming you're familiar with R, and you will be if you're not already, but you probably are. Anyway, P is 60 over 100, and if, when, we type, uh, when we type P, we get 0.6, and that's the numerical estimate. We can test statistical hypotheses. In general, okay, you've got, here's the general framework for hypothesis testing that everybody uses, and we're going to use in this course too. The model is that there's some set of observable data y, which could be a big vector, and it's distributed according to some probability distribution, the f means cumulative distribution function, as a function of theta, those are the unknown parameters, and that can be a vector too. And uh, yeah, y is the data vector, and script y is the sample space. That's the place where the um, where the data where the data live. So that, for example, if um, if the y if the data vector y were just y one through y n, where y one through y n were real numbers, then the sample space script y would just be r n, the um, the n dimensional real number set of real numbers. Um, theta is the parameter. And uh, cap theta is the parameter space, so theta lives in, in cap theta. Yeah, there we go. And uh, the null hypothesis is that theta inhabits some subset of the uh, parameter space versus the alternative hypothesis that uh, theta is somewhere else. Yes, I know you could have theta being a member of some subset of the parameter space versus an alternative that theta is some particular number so that, the, uh, so that under this common way of setting things up, especially in theoretical courses, it would be possible for uh, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis not to cover the whole parameter space, but I want them to cover the whole parameter space. It just makes more sense. So um, there's never any harm in doing it my way. It just sometimes is a little bit more work, but you come out with the same answers as you do in the other approach. Um, the meaning of the null hypothesis is null, is that nothing interesting is happening. Yeah, right, that the, uh, that the population correlation is zero, or that the, um, that the, that the difference between the two um, population means is zero, or nothing, you know, the treatment didn't work, the, the drug was ineffective. Uh, nobody cares, that kind of thing. N null. And then the uh, alternative will be that something is happening, something interesting is happening. We use C, a subset of the sample space for the critical region, and we'll reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative when the data vector gets into the critical region C, which is often defined in terms of a critical value and a test statistic has got to be, say, bigger than some critical value. But notice that that always defines a set of y1 through yn. You know, the set of y1 through yn such that z, the test statistic, is bigger than 1.96 or something like that. That's actually a set of y1 through yn that's defined it in terms of these critical values. Um, the significance level, alpha, the size of the test, that's the maximum probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Maximum because you know, often we say that it's the probability of rejecting the null when the null is true, but actually the null region, theta zero, specified by the null hypothesis, could have more than one point. And so there's just one alpha, and that's the maximum or supremum of all the uh, probabilities of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. Because there'll be a different probability usually for every theta that's in the null hypothesis region of the parameter space. Conventionally, alpha equals 0.05. Um, this uh, is really, really set in stone in a lot of journals in the social and biological sciences. Lots and lots of people, um, especially statisticians, think it's a little bit silly, uh, but the alternative is that if you um, don't have a very, very clear criteria 
for these scientists to push it until um, they'll uh, be ready to write a paper or make a conference presentation about any finding, uh, any any trend, any noise, any noise in their data. So um, in practice, the alpha equals 0.05 level holds them back, and it's a, in my view, it's a good thing. Uh, logically, it's not so great, but practically, it's it's good. Where did it come from? Well, Fisher, who dreamed most of this stuff up, uh, said, well, I don't know, It's uh, what you want to do is you want to make the probability of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis small. What's small? Oh, I don't know. It's pretty arbitrary. What about 1 in 20? And everybody said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And so that's where the 0.05 level came from. It comes from uh, uh, believing Fisher, which is usually a good idea. But maybe they took it too far. The And the p-value is the smallest value of alpha, the smallest significance level for which the null hypothesis can be rejected. Um, and conventionally, small p-values are interpreted as providing stronger evidence against the null hypothesis, another idea of Fisher's. Um, the idea of type 1 and type 2 error is mostly named in Pearson rather than Fisher. And uh, type 1 error is to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. And um, that's a bad thing because if you usually, right, the null hypothesis says nothing is going on. And if you reject it when it's true, you're concluding that something is going on when in fact nothing is going on. And that's bad because it's false knowledge and it fills the journals with um, false information and then students have to memorize it and people make medical decisions based on it and it's a problem and it some, often takes a really long time for false knowledge to get flushed out. Um, so yeah, type 1 error is bad. Type 2 error is bad too and that's to not reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. When the null hypothesis is false, there is usually a phenomenon or a trend or something to be discovered and yet you don't reject the null hypothesis so you don't discover it and that's bad too. Which one is worse? Honestly depends upon the particular problem. Um, 1 minus the probability of a type 2 error, which would be the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false, is called the power of the test. Uh, and I guess if two uh, tests have got the same uh, significance level, the same maximum pro probability of a type 1 error, the one with higher power is better. And uh, power can also be used to select sample size, which is the, something that we'll do in this course. Um, so, question, another sample question. Carry out a test to determine which brand of coffee is preferred. Uh, and again, the model is Bernoulli. Um, you start by stating the null hypothesis. Why theta equals 0.5? Well, theta equals 0.5 means that the, a person randomly chosen from the population would have about a 50% chance of choosing the new coffee or the old coffee, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, there's no, there's no clear, no clear overall preference for one brand of coffee versus the other. And the alternative is that theta is not equal to 50%. And so if theta is not equal to 50%, that means that one of the blends is preferred over the other. So this seems like a pretty reasonable, um, a, a pretty reasonable null hypothesis. Could you make a case for a one-sided test? Ah, one-sided tests. Well, um, one, uh, yes, yes, you could. For example, suppose that the, you know that if you change the blend of coffee in a fast food restaurant, the expense involved in changing uh, the blend of coffee could be considerable, right? The machines might have to be different, uh, or anyway, their settings would have to be different. People might have to be retrained. The suppliers would have to be um, rearranged, and the whole thing will probably cost a lot of money. If the new blend is no better than the old blend, why would you make that change? In fact, suppose that the new blend is a lot worse than the old blend. Well, 
what would your um, and what's the implication for action? Well, you just wouldn't change it if they were the if the two blends were the same. You wouldn't make a change if the two blends were uh, different and the and and the new one was worse. Then you wouldn't make a change. So since there's no implication for action, why not have a one-tailed test? That's a reasonable question in in this case. Um, in so notice, however, that this example is a kind of an industrial uh, marketing practical example, and if it's science then you have to ask, is there ever the case when you would want a one-tailed test, when you could really, really justify a one-tailed test? Because what if the results came out in the opposite direction? Would you really um, completely ignore them? Or would you then all of a sudden change your whole hypothesis and your whole way of looking at things until you said, oh yeah, well that's what we expected. That was the, you know, there, there were two really two theories and, and, and theory B predicts that and so we've supported theory B. So you see what that would do, right? That if you, if you allowed people to use one-tailed tests, if you allowed scientists to use one-tailed tests freely, they would, uh, in effect, instead of using the 0.05 level, they'd be using the 0.1 level because either way, no matter which way the results came out, they would uh, still be ready to talk about it. And so to hold that, that back, in, or, in order to hold this, tendon, this human tendency in check, most of the time we'll go with a two-tailed test. So I'm going to get back to this same issue in a few slides and give you an example. Um, so getting back to this particular case, um, alpha equals 0.05, uh, as usual. And <clears throat> the central limit theorem says that y bar, yeah, it's got an approximately normal distribution with mean uh, theta, which is mu, and variance. Well, what's sigma squared? Sigma squared, well, sigma squared is um, uh, theta times 1 minus theta, because that's the sigma squared, the variance of the Bernoulli random variable, divided by n. So there's quite a few uh, different valid test statistics for this. Um, and here's two of them. Um, Z, in Z1, okay, this is a straight central limit theorem um, in which you have uh, Y bar being normal. Under the null hypothesis, Y bar, y bar is normal with mean theta and variance Oh, excuse me, theta zero, the, the hypothesized value, which for our example is one half, divided by, uh, excuse me, the uh, that's the mean, the mean is theta zero, and the variance is theta zero times one minus theta zero, all divided by the square, uh, all divided by n, and so the um, standardized mean is y bar minus theta zero uh, over square root theta times one minus, theta zero times one minus theta zero, um, divided by n, bring the n up into the numerator. Another version, instead of using the null hypothesis version in the denominator, you simply estimate it with y bar. And asymptotically, that is to say as the sample size increases, well if the truth, if the null hypothesis is true and theta really does equal theta zero, then that y bar times one minus y bar in the denominator will converge closely to theta zero times one minus theta zero, and the two statistics will be very, very close, um, especially for large samples. This indicates, just this amount of talk indicates that we're going to have to talk about large sample theory pretty soon in order to pin some of these concepts down. Um, what's the critical value? Your answer is a number. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm uh, pretending to uh, be asking. Actually, the whole thing is uh, kind of like a typical um, test or an exam or exam question, one of the easy ones that get you get your confidence up before the real questions start. Um, with R, uh, alpha equals 0.05, uh, and then Q norm, Q norm is the inverse of the cumulative normal distribution function. And so that's the Q norm of something is the area under the standard normal curve that's less than it. Um, I, that, excuse me, that's P norm. P norm is the area under the standard normal curve that's less than it. And Q norm is that point that cuts off the, that um, amount of the 
standard normal curve. And so 1 minus alpha over 2 uh, uh, cuts off uh, the, the top um, the top two and a half percent or the or the bottom uh, 97 and a half percent of the no standard normal distribution and the answer is 1.96. Um, calculate the test statistics uh, under the assumption that 60 out of the 100 preferred the new blend. Um, uh, Z1 is, yeah there it is, so uh, theta equals 0.5, y bar is, is 0.6, n is 100, and this line just exactly uh, calculates this uh, test statistic. Um, the semicolon means you can put more than one R command on a single line. Saying Z1 means, uh, just typing Z1 means display it, send it to the standard output, and, it, and the answer is 2. Um, the uh, 2 is bigger than 1.96, so it's bigger than a critical value when we reject the null hypothesis. And the p-value is, uh, well, that's the area under the curve. Um, notice we use the use of p-norm. Um, uh, it's the it's the it's the area under the uh, curve out beyond two uh, in both directions, and that's about 0.04. And since p is less than 0.05, we do reject the null hypothesis and so on. Um, for Z2, we get a very uh, a lot of copy and pasting. Notice I use y bar here instead of theta zero, but almost the same almost the same code and almost the same results too. Um, same uh, conclusion from the two tests and very, very similar p-values. And there's more. There's more valid test statistics, too, even for this little problem. Um, conclusions. Do you reject the null hypothesis? Yeah, but just barely. Isn't the alpha equals 0.05 significance level pretty arbitrary? Yeah, but if people insist on a yes or no answer, that's what you give them. Um, what do you conclude in symbols? Theta is not equal to 0.5. Specifically, theta is bigger than 0.5. What do you conclude in plain language? Your answer is a statement about coffee. You need to make a clear distinction between the kind of conclusions that you make in the formal world of the statistical model and the corresponding conclusions that you make about the outside world. So in plain language, your answer is a statement about coffee, not about the null hypothesis and the power of the test and the you know significance level and a you know statistically significant blah blah blah. It's an it's a it's a statement about coffee. More consumers prefer the new blend of coffee beans. Ah, can you really draw directional conclusions when all you did was reject a non-directional null hypothesis? Okay, this is pretty good, right? This is a logical point. The null hypothesis was that theta equals 0.5. The alternative is that theta is not equal to 0.5. We rejected the null hypothesis and concluded the alternative. So it seems then to a lot of people that all we can really say is that theta is not 0.5. Not that it's less than or greater than, but just that it's, it could be either one. Right? Because that was the logical basis of the test. So the question is, can you really draw a direction? And, and by the way, this doesn't just apply to tests about proportions, right? It applies to lots and lots of things, you know, virtually everything. Can you really draw directional conclusions when all you did was reject a non-directional null hypothesis? Answer? Yes. Why? Okay. Here's here's a, a tech, here's the technical here it's a technical issue. Um, first of all, in this class, we're going to mostly avoid one-tailed tests because mostly we're at, we're analyzing scientific data. Why? As I mentioned earlier, ask what would happen if the results were strong in the opposite direction to what was predicted. Ah, the dental example. All right. In one set of data that I acquired from the uh, U of T School of Dentistry when I was doing the statistical consulting course, they had a drug that they were thinking of injecting into people. And the idea was this. When people get a tooth replaced, they get a false tooth, sometimes those teeth are um, just on a little wire framework that, that, that's um, 
connected to the other teeth in the mouth, but sometimes they bolt the, the, the false tooth directly down into the, into the bone of the jaw. And what they do is they put the, they put the, um, they put the tooth in there in a, in a screw, and then they wait for the thing, then they wait for the thing to heal. And this drug was intended to make the healing process faster and the bond stronger between the tooth and the, um, uh, between the, between the tooth and the bone. And they didn't do it on people. As a preliminary exp experiment, they did it on rabbits. And rabbits have mouths that are kind of small, so they took regular human false teeth and screwed them not into the jawbone, but into the, the limbs, the forelimbs, the, like the arm uh, limbs of the rabbits. And 50% um, of the rabbits were injected with this drug and the other 50% were not. And they, um, they waited varying lengths of time before killing the rabbit, which they used the word sacrificed the rabbit, like it was some bizarre religion. Anyway, they sacrificed the rabbits after various time lengths, and then they uh, pulled the tooth out of the rabbit's arm with a machine that measured the force that was required to extract the tooth, right? And the hope was that this, or the expectation was, that this drug would uh, make the tooth be more firmly bonded so that it would require more force to pull it out. In fact, the analysis revealed that the experimental drug, the rabbits that were injected with the experimental drug, less force was required. Statistically significantly, rejecting the null hypothesis, less force was required to remove the tooth than the rabbits that were just allowed to heal normally. That is to say the drug was actually harmful and so, well, we never saw them again. But what did they do? They probably went away and tried to figure out why the drug had the opposite effect that they expected. If they had a one-tailed test, their alternative hypothesis would have corresponded to their research hypothesis, the way they tell you in the elementary statistics courses, and they would have failed to reject the null hypothesis, and then they wouldn't have concluded anything if they were purists. But of course, you can't expect people to not conclude anything. So again, this example shows what would happen if the results were strong in the opposite and in the opposite direction to what was predicted. And the answer is almost always in science that, well, people would talk about it. People would do something about it. People would, uh, would, say, would say something. And so to guard against that, we're going to avoid one-tailed tests. But when the null hypothesis is rejected, we still draw con directional conclusions. This assumes that it's a, a test uh, for um, a single regression coefficient or a single difference between means or something, you know, basically a one degree of freedom test where it's possible to see a single direction. But we'll still draw directional conclusions when the null hypothesis is rejected. For example, if X is income and Y is credit card debt and we're doing some kind of simple regression, we might test the null hypothesis that beta 1 equals 0 with a two-sided t-test. Um, so suppose that P equals 0 0.002 and beta hat 1 is 1.27, so the regression coefficient is positive, the slope of the least squares line is positive, we've rejected the null hypothesis at this conventional 0 0.05 level, and we will say consumers with higher incomes tend to have more credit card debt because that's, that's the, notice that that's the direction. But really, all we had was a null hypothesis that beta 1 was equal to 0 versus the alternative that beta 1 was not equal to 0. Is it justified? Well, you better hope so, because otherwise, all you could say is, there's a connection between income and average credit card debt. And you couldn't say what that connection was. So then they, that is the people who are hiring you, um, ask, what's the connection? Do people with lower incomes have more debt? And you'd have to say, sorry, I don't know. I can't tell. And it's, that's a good way to get fired or at least look silly. So here's a technical resolution to the technical problem. We'll decompose the two-sided test into a set of one, excuse me, into a set of two one-sided tests, each with significance level alpha over two, a set that's equivalent to the two-sided test. Here's what I mean. Um, here's the two-sided test. 
This is a normal distribution. Uh, that's the uh, approximate distribution of the Z1 or Z2 statistic under the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is state equals a half versus is not a half. And here are the two tails of the distribution. And if the test statistic gets out either into the left tail or into the right tail, then we'll reject the null hypothesis. And if the null hypothesis is true, then the probability of that happening in either direction is approximately 0.05. The approximately part comes from the large sample theory that we have to talk about. Here's another, here's a left-sided test. Here, the null hypothesis is that theta is bigger than or equal to a half versus the alternative that it's less than a half. Um, and this says alpha equals 0.05, but that is a typo, which I will fix in the posted slides, but not in this video, because I'm too deep into it. Uh, alpha equals 0.025. See, there's the 0.025 that would be the um, uh, maximum probability of rejecting the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis were um, true. And notice that that maximum would happen when the uh, when when theta is actually equal to exactly a half. Here's the right-sided test. Again, we'll notice that, it, that, the, um, that, the, that the, the alpha of this right-sided test is 0.025 and not 0.05. And here, the null hypothesis is theta is less than or equal to a half versus uh, the alternative that it's um, bigger than a half. And so if you look at all of these tests together, you'll see that you're going to um, for the, you're going to reject the null hypothesis of this first test if and only if you reject the null hypothesis for one of these one-tail tests. So they're equivalent. Doing the initial test is logically equivalent, if and only if, to doing the uh, components, the left-sided component and the right-sided component which have significance level 0.025. These are all 0.025s here, though it's too small to see. You carry out both of the one-sided tests. And from the one-sided tests, you could draw a directional conclusion if the null hypothesis is rejected. So it's a kind of a trick. It's also, by the way, a multiple comparison, a kind of a follow-up test if you think of a one-factor analysis of variance, right? And you're comparing several group means, and then you reject the null hypothesis that you know mu one equals mu two equals mu three with a uh, an F test or something like that. You're left with this question: Well, is one different from two? Really? Is one different from three? Is two different from three? And those multiple comparisons form a family of hypothesis tests that you use to probe and find out where your initial significance came from. This is a simple example of that. The first one could be considered the initial test, and then these two could be considered the follow-up tests. And notice that if the null hypothesis is true, the probability of rejecting at least one of these is 0.05, which is the same as the significance level of the uh, uh, initial test. So they're really equivalent. The summary of the technical resolution is that we decompose the two-sided tests into a set of two one-sided tests, each with significance level alpha over 2. And those are equivalent to the two-sided test. But in practice, all you do is look at the sign of the regression coefficient, or, or look at the two sample means and see, see which one is bigger. Essentially, using common sense and making the common sense conclusion about which one is larger. Under the surface, you're decomposing the two-sided test into these one-sided tests, but you never mention it unless that technical question comes up, which it only will come up with somebody who's interested in theory and interested in the formal world more than in the, um, well, in addition to uh, the, the actual problem at hand. This is an example of plain language conclusions. Yes, when we've got our conclusions in the formal world of the statistical model, we then move to the, the outside world of the substantive problem, and then it's very important to change vocabularies and use plain language. 
In particular, it's important to state directional conclusions and, to, and state them clearly in terms of the subject matter, not in terms, no Greek letters, and no jargon that you would only learn if you had taken a statistics course. You need to say what happened. And if you're asked to state the conclusion in plain language, your answer must be free of statistical jargon, mumbo jumbo, whatever you want to call it. Um, in particular, this directional conclusion business comes up. And the marking rule is that if the question asks for plain language and you draw a non-directional conclusion, when a directional conclusion is possible, you'll get half marks at most. Yeah, right? If you say that uh, the, uh, the drug had an effect on uh, how firmly the tooth was implanted in the jaw, but you don't say whether it helped or it hurt, then you get half marks. Of course, if you give a directional conclusion and it's the wrong one, you get a zero. Uh, here's another thing that comes up. What about negative conclusions? What would we say if Z equals 1.84? Um, well, here's two possibilities in, in plain language. You could say, this study does not provide clear evidence that consumers prefer one blend of coffee beans over the other. It doesn't say that their preference was the same. It doesn't affirm the null hypothesis. You haven't supported the null hypothesis when you've, this is Fisher's point of view, is that you had, haven't supported the null hypothesis when you failed to reject it. You've just not rejected it. So you can give a reasonable plain language conclusion. You can say this study doesn't provide clear evidence that the consumers prefer one blend of coffee beans over the other. And people who know this issue, this issue of accepting the null hypothesis or not, will appreciate what you're doing. And other people will say, oh, there wasn't any difference. Um, or you could say, the results are consistent with no difference in preference for the two coffee bean blends. <laughs> this is a, a sort of a little hidden reference to the null hypothesis. That is to say, you can't reject the null hypothesis of no difference. And again, people who are in the know will realize what you're saying, and other people will just say, oh, there wasn't a, there wasn't an there wasn't a difference. Um, in this course, we're not just going to casually accept the null hypothesis. In theoretically oriented courses, very often one does uh, live in the name and Pearson world where um, you either, ex if you uh, reject the null hypothesis, then you accept the alternative. And if you don't reject the null hypothesis, then you accept it and reject the alternative. Um, this is a, uh, this is an old, uh, this is an old debate between uh, Fisher and Naaman Pearson. And um, we'll, uh, for right now, in this course at least, uh, we're going to take Fisher's side. And, um, and we won't accept the null hypothesis. Please don't. Um, just to go over the idea of confidence intervals, um, you give, make a point estimate of a parameter, and it might give you a false sense of precision. You really should provide some kind of a margin of probable error as well. Um, and the, uh, for the taste test example, approximately for large n, OK, so you've got the, the probability of, uh, of a standard normal random variable being between, you know this, this notation here, this z alpha over 2? The z, z alpha over 2 is the point on the standard normal curve that cuts off the top alpha over 2 of the, um, of the distribution. So that's 1 minus alpha uh, is uh, the probability that a uh, standard normal is going to between going to be between minus and plus uh, z sub alpha over two, and so then you know how it goes. You you substitute in the um, you substitute in the uh, the test statistic z, and then do a little bit of algebra to isolate theta and get theta in the middle. Yeah, you know you fool around with it. What do you do? You know multiply uh, all three terms by the square root of y bar times one minus y bar, and then um, multiply through the square root of n and uh, subtract uh, square root of n y bar from all three terms and so on. And after about four or five steps, you uh, arrive with theta in the middle of the interval. And that interval is the confidence interval. And you can talk about it as y bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 times y bar or 1 minus y bar over the square root of n if you wanted to. Um, uh, and that, and this, this part here, the second part, the plus or minus part, is sometimes called the margin of error. And uh, if alpha is 0.05, it's the 95% margin of error. 
or in the 95% confidence interval. Um, the 95% uh, confidence interval for the taste test data, the answer is a pair of numbers. See, notice this is a, another another uh, test question. Uh, show some work. So here's some work. Uh, means not all the work, but write down the formula, plug in the numbers, you know, do your magic with your calculator, and you get a, a, a confidence interval from uh, 0.5 to about almost 0.7. Uh, and in a report, you could say the estimated proportion preferring the new coffee bean is a 0 0.6 plus or minus uh, uh, 0 0.96, or a kind of talk which I've seen in newspapers, which is actually very good. You could say 60% of consumers preferred the new blend. These results are expected to be accurate within 10 percentage points. That's the... Um, uh, 0.096, it's about 10, about 10 percent. 19 times out of 20, and this 19 times out of 20 indicates that we're talking about a 95 percent confidence interval. It's, it's, it's quite nice. This is this second one especially. Yeah, the, the other one's okay, but the second one is especially good as a plain language answer. Um, the meaning of the confidence interval. We calculated a 95 percent confidence interval of 0.504 to point uh, 696, does that mean that the probability of the thetas between those two numbers is 95%? Oh no, not at all. Those quantities, that is 0 .05, 0 0.504, 0 0.696, and theta, they're all constants. So if this statement here, if it makes sense at all to talk about the probability that a constant is between another set of constants. If it makes any sense at all, that probability has got to be either 0 or 1. By the way, we will see in a little while that the Bayesian view of this is different and that in, uh, in, in, in Bayesian terms, something like this, these the numbers wouldn't be quite the same. But the idea of the probability that the unknown quantity is between one number and another number makes perfectly good sense. It just doesn't make sense in a frequentist world. So this is what's going on. The endpoints of the confidence interval, they're random variables. And the numbers 0.504 and 0.696 are actually realizations of those random variables arising from a particular random sample. Yeah, well, I'll, let me just click back through all this. And yeah, I mean, this stuff here, right? This y bar minus z alpha over two times the square root of y bar. You know, this these are these are functions of, of the sample data through y bar. And every time you get a new set of sample data, you get a different endpoint, a different left endpoint and a different right endpoint of the confidence interval. So it's the endpoints of the confidence interval that are random. And you've calculated it for exactly one random sample, and so you get particular numbers. So yeah, so the numbers 0.504 and 0.696, they're realizations of those random variables that come from a particular random sample. The real meaning of the probability statement is that if we were to calculate an interval in this manner for a large number of random samples, the interval would contain the true parameter around 95% of the time. That's what it means. That is basically the confidence interval is a guess, and the guess is either right or wrong, but it's constructed by a method that's right 95% of the time. A little bit subtle, but that's the real meaning of a confidence interval. Yeah, you can have confidence regions for a parameter vector if it's a multi-parameter problem, um, or multi-dimensional functions of the parameter vector, and confidence regions correspond to tests. Um, as a quick example of this, uh, remember our Z1s and Z2, uh, notice that the null hypothesis taking Z2 as an example, the null hypothesis is not rejected, okay, if and only if the test statistic is not out on the tail, right? It's between minus Z alpha over two and Z alpha over two. And then you can substitute what um, Z2 is, and then, then you know what you do? You go through all these machinations, all these calculations, and those calculations are exactly the same 
calculations that you use to derive the confidence interval. This is then going to happen if and only if theta 0 is between a left end of a confidence interval and a right end of a confidence interval. And so the confidence interval, and that's what it is, right? This is, this is, this is the confidence interval. It's, for, it's, the, um, uh, it's the values between y bar minus something, blah, blah, and y bar plus that something. That confidence interval consists of the parameter values theta value, theta zero, null hypothesis values for which the null hypothesis is not rejected. And so the, this is the basis of this statement, that the null hypothesis is rejected at significance level alpha, if and only if the value given by the null hypothesis is outside the 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. And that value is very often 0. You know, it'd be like a difference between means of 0 and so on. In this particular case, it's a, uh, it's a half. Theta 0 is a half for our exact problem. But the null hypothesis is going to be rejected if and only if the null hypothesis value for, for a two-tailed test is outside the 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval. OK. One of the steps, one of the early steps, before you saw the data in this process of statistical analysis is one of the steps was perhaps, if you have an opportunity, select your sample size. So you can ask. Where did that n equals 100 come from in this, in this problem? Well, probably somebody just liked 100 because there's 100 pennies and a dollar, and I don't know. You know, 100, that's a good number. It seems like a lot, right? 100. OK, let's, let's survey 100 consumers. But we should be more systematic, and we can, and we can do it. Uh, so sample size can be selected before seeing the data, either to achieve a desired margin of error or to achieve a desired statistical power if you're planning to do tests, or there are other reasonable ways to do it too, which we might get to in this course. Um, statistical power, right? It's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the net null hypothesis is false, and more power is good in, in a statistical world. Um, because if the null hypothesis is false, you want to have a high probability of, of drawing the correct conclusion, rejecting it. And it's not just one number. It's a function of the parameters. Every parameter value potentially yields a different value of power. Um, and usually, for pretty good tests, statistical tests, which is the kind we use, for any sample size n, the more incorrect the null hypothesis is, the bigger the power. And for any parameter value satisfying the alternative, that is to say, for any parameter value, or if it's a vector, configuration of parameter values such that the null hypothesis is false, the larger the sample size is, the bigger the power. So here's how a general picture of how one could use uh, statistical power analysis to select a sample size before seeing any data. So you pick an effect that you'd like to be able to detect. That will correspond to a parameter value such that the null hypothesis is false. And there'll be infinitely many, but the one you should select should be just over the boundary of interesting and meaningful. You definitely, if, it were, if that were true, it would be scientifically meaningful and something you'd want to talk about. Um, then you pick a desired power. That's a probability with which you'd like to be able to detect the effect in question, which you'll do by rejecting the null hypothesis. What, 80%, 90%? I want to be 99% sure. That's up to you. As the effect is, these both, both these first two points are up to the user, so to speak. And the user is either a scientist or a scientist slash statistician. You start, so you can start with a fairly small sample size and calculate the power. And the power is probably not going to be enough. And then increase the sample size until the desired power is reached. That's how you can do it. And, that's, and then that way you can tell how much sample size you need. There are two main issues here. First, what's an interesting or meaningful parameter value? And second, how do you calculate the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis? Um, 
to me, the second one is relatively easy. And the first one, uh, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> the first one uh, is in the world of reality, the, the, the real world to which you're applying statistics. And um, that's tricky. And how you, the mechanics of calculating the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis is a technical um, issue in the pure world of the model and mathematics and uh, computing and stuff like that, and that's pretty easy. So let's do it for this particular uh, easy example that we've been doing. And this is the pattern that one would follow for more complicated problems, too. So th this, I guess, hmm, let's see. The true parameter value is theta. Now, this is a value theta, like what? Theta that, some value of theta that's not, we know, we know what, would, what the probability is of rejecting the null hypothesis. If theta equals a half, that's the null hypothesis value. The probability would be, you know, 0.05. But if theta's not a half, then we want to um, calculate the power. Um, so if we're doing this for uh, in a for real, uh, not for real, um, with numerical values instead of symbols like we're about to do, the value of theta that you do this for would be chosen so that it's pretty interesting. I mean, like is fifty one percent good enough? Maybe not. How about fifty five? Fifty five might be okay. Fifty five percent preference. How about seventy percent preference? Oh well, that's definitely. That's definitely something that you would want to have. But you don't want to have too large a number. You want to have something that's on the boundary, about 60%, 55%. I don't know, right? See, even for this simple taste test example, I'm not sure what a really good um, value of theta would be. But anyway, here's the second part. Here's how to actually calculate the, um, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis correctly. Yeah, so it's the prob one minus the probability of being between, yeah, so it's, this is the probability of being bigger than z sub alpha over 2 or less than minus z alpha over 2 and rejecting the null hypothesis. So then we pop in the um, uh, an expression for the test statistic and then, but you see here's the trick. If the null hypothesis is true, this expression has got an approximately standard normal distribution by the central limit theorem, which is large sample theory, and we have to talk about it soon. But if the null hypothesis is false, and its true parameter is theta, which is not equal to theta zero, then this object has some other distribution, and we don't know offhand what it is right now. So the little algebra that I'm about to show you, and I mean little because this there's a reason why these characters on the screen are so small. It's because there's going to be a lot of them in a short time. Is that what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to fool around with this until I, get, um, until I get y bar minus the real theta, not y bar minus theta zero. So what do I do? I'm going to multiply all three terms by the square root of y bar times 1 minus y bar. I'm going to divide by the square root of n. Um, I'm going to um, actually get rid of the, um, then I'm going to get rid of the theta 0 uh, by adding theta 0 to all three sides. And then I'm going to add the real theta to all three sides and then unwrap it and get another square root of y bar times 1 minus y bar around there until I get something that's actually got a standard normal distribution under the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so that's the basis of the high school algebra that follows, and there's a lot of it. And eventually, well, you know, that's what I did, right? I, I, um, I had to, in the, in the end, um, I know, you see, look at the red term. The red thing has got an approximate standard normal distribution under the alternative hypothesis. And at one point I had to uh, divide all three terms by the square root of the true theta times 1 minus theta. There's theta 1 minus theta. Um, and so on. Until I got a z in the middle that's really a, a standard normal. Yeah, there's the z. Notice the z is still red. And it's 1 minus the problem. Now, now under the alternative hypothesis, this z has got a standard normal distribution, or pretty close. The pretty close is why these equal signs are kind of a little bit squiggly for approximately equal to. And that's the same as 
Oh, phi. Phi is the uh, is a conventional symbol for the uh, cumulative distribution function of a standard normal random variable. So basically, it's phi of it's one minus phi of this one minus phi of the left one, and then there's a minus, so they get switched around a little bit, and we wind up with this expression for the power. Yeah, and, and phi is the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal. Um, here's an R function to calculate approximate power for the test of a single proportion. Basically, taking this last, um, this last expression and programming it. You've certainly used R before for doing basic stuff like regressions and so on. Maybe maybe you've gone deeply into it. You might not have seen how to write your own R function to calculate something. Here's an example. So here's the here's what we're we're calculating. We're calculating this formula, this power power formula. And I'm gonna call it I'm gonna call my my function Z2 power. The syntax is, we say the name of the function equals, and then function, and then parenthesis, and then you give the arguments of the function. What do we need in order to compute this quantity? We need n. We need the true value of theta 0. That was a military jet flying over the CNE on Labor Day. Um, you need the true value of theta. Um, yeah, you need n, the true value of theta, and you need the theta zero, the value under the null hypothesis, and you also need alpha because with uh, uh, alpha, the significance level, we can't just assume it's five. Uh, it's five percent. You can uh, you can obtain z alpha over two. Okay, so function. It's a function of theta, the true parameter value, and the sample size. Theta zero, but it's for this kind of test, it's so frequent that you're interested in a theta 0 of 0.5 that we'll give it a default value. So if we invoke this function and we don't say what theta 0 is, it'll be assumed to be a half. And also, if we don't say what alpha is, we can make it have alpha anything we want. But if we don't say what it is, it'll be 0.05. And then squirrely brackets to begin the function. And then the function definition is between the opening curly bracket and the closed cur uh, curly bracket. And then we do some uh, calculations. You see this thing, square root of n times theta 0 minus theta over the square root of you know, this. It appears in both this part and that part. I called it the effect, which it kind of is, right? It's the difference between the null hypothesis value theta 0 and the true value, but scaled relative to this um, theta times 1 minus theta, rel basically relative to the uh, standard deviation of the, um, of the sample proportion y bar. Anyway, I called this, this whole thing, this whole fraction, I called effect, calculated it. Um, I had to get z alpha over 2, and that's q norm of 1 minus alpha over 2, that's right. Um, and then uh, I, ooh, I used, this is perhaps a bad, uh, a bad habit. I think I've broken it since I wrote this function, but um, I used, within the function z2 power, I used a, um, I used the name z2 power to refer to the value that I was going to return in the function. So uh, I might have called, instead of using z2 power, I think my code would be clearer here if I called this something like value equals 1 minus p norm of effects plus z, effect plus effect minus z. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then by just saying the name of the value that I've computed, I'll return it. And that's the end of the function uh, z2 power. I could have, if I were writing this function yesterday instead of however long ago I wrote this, I would probably say value equals this, and then the la my last line would be return parenthesis, value close parenthesis. That would be somewhat better coding. The effect is the same. Anyway, 
Here's some numerical examples with R. Um, first, I just tried, um, uh, notice that I didn't have to say theta equals 0.5 or n equals 100. It's the first argument is 0.5 and the second argument is 100. That should be, that should be 0.05, and it is. And then I calculated what if the true parameter value were 55% instead of 50 with n equals 100, what's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis? And the answer is around 17%, which if you wanted to detect 55% as statistically significant by rejecting the null hypothesis, that wouldn't be very good news at all. That's a very low power. That means that you've gone to all the trouble of, uh, here's, a, here's a, an effect that you think is interesting and meaningful from a marketing perspective, say for example, and you've gone to all the trouble to carry out this taste test and recruit all the subjects and hire the research firm that got the, um, the coffee drinkers and all this other stuff. And if you're right and your new beans are better to this degree, then you've only got a 17% chance of detecting it. That's bad news. What if it was 60% instead of 55? Now your probability goes up of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis goes up to 53%, which is still pretty lousy. If you make it 65%, which is like an overwhelming preference, I think, then your power goes up to uh, 88%. So you see that by writing a function and just trying a few examples, you can learn a lot about the problem and, and what your sample size should be like. What if the probability of, re of preferring the new beans were 40%? Well, it's a two-sided test, and everything is symmetric. So this 53% here, chance of rejecting the null hypothesis, is the same as the 53% up here. That is, the, the, the chances of rejecting the null hypothesis um, in favor of the new blend and against the new blend are the same, about 53%. What if, going back to this 55%, what if we had n equals 500? 500 consumers tasting these coffees. Power goes up to 61%. With 1,000 consumers and a 55% preference for the new blend, then you get your, you're getting your probability of rejecting the null hypothesis up into a level that would be considered quite healthy. But 1,000 is would be a surprise to most people and that's good right this this shows you why it's a good idea to do formal power analysis because sometimes the results will surprise you and the way you're usually surprised is that you think you have a reasonable study uh, yeah 100 consumers you know that seems pretty good and a reasonable sample size but in fact your sample size is much too small to give you a decent chance of rejecting the null hypothesis. So if you do a study with n equals 100, chances are very good that you're just wasting your money. Statistical power analysis, a way to save money. This is why they should hire you as a consultant. Continuing here, well suppose that we compromise. See, you know what, what this, the, what this, this is a, this is a piece of, hmm, this, move, this, this news sobers them up. This news makes them feel a little bit glum and they're not so excited anymore. So then they decide to compromise and instead of 55%, well, they, what about 60? Okay, I can live with 60. I guess 55 was too optimistic because they know that they can't afford uh, 1,000 consumers. But what about, what about 60%? And so this, the question becomes, find the smallest sample size needed to detect a th theta of 60%, that is a preference for the new brand of 60%, as different from 50 with probability at least 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is a pretty reasonable power value. It's kind of gotten conventional, though it's not as conventional as the 0.05 level. So here's a way to do it. What we're going to do is we, um, um, I'm going to set the sample size to 1, that's n, and then I'll compute the power Here's the idea. I'm going to set the sample size to a small value. You have to admit one is small. And then calculate the power 
calculate the power value for theta equals 0.6, n equals the sample size, and then take a look. The sample size is about five, I mean the power is about 5%. And then we'll put this whole thing inside a while loop. This is the, uh, this is the R prompt. And you go while power is less than 80%. And then start, and then because of the while, you get a prompt from R, which is the, um, this sort of a continuation, this plus sign. Start the squirrely bra bracket. And inside this, inside this while loop, you increment the sample size and calculate the power again. Close the while loop. When you hit return here where we are now, it, uh, it checks power is, um, power is 0.05. It increments, a sample size becomes 2. Checks it again, again, and again, and again, and the power is going up and up and up and up. And at the end, you get a prompt. Nothing happens. So, but if you type sample size, you'll get the most recently calculated sample size, which will be the one that caused power to go above 80%. It was 189. By typing power and return, you get the power that was calculated at the last step. And it is indeed not 80%, but just a little bit of, over it. And so you see that you need a, po a sample size of 189 in order to have, if you're if the true level of preference for the new beans, coffee beans, is 60%, then this particular test of theta, theta 0 equals 0.5 will reject the null hypothesis with probability at least 0.8, a good degree of power, if your sample size is at least 189. And so probably they would choose 200 or something like that. And this would be a successful power analysis. Of course, more complicated models require more thought about the parameter values. So what's required of the scientist who wants to select sample size by power analysis? The scientist needs to specify the parameter value. By the way, if we're doing exercises in this class, you're the scientist as well as the statistician. But in applications, most applications, you've got a scientist who's not a statistician. Um, so that means that the scientist has to specify the parameter values that she wants to be able to detect as different from the null hypothesis value. That is the difference between means, a correlation coefficient, a regression coefficient, whatever it is. And also a desired power, which is a probability of detecting that effect as statistically significant by rejecting the null hypothesis. And it's not always easy for a scientist to think in terms of the parameters of a statistical model. Scientists tend to think in terms of data. And to the extent that they think about statistical models at all, they see the Greek letters and they think of them as, oh yeah, these are the population values of certain statistics. Yeah, fine. And so sometimes it helps. That's a helpful way to think. And scientists can understand parameters as being um, population values of statistics. Uh, and if that works, then the scientist has a chance of thinking of the parameters of a statistical model. But, but in order to um, select interesting parameter values, you have to think, the, the scientist has to think about the statistical model. The person from the outside world has to come into the clean room. And, um, and, that's, and that's pretty tough. And then, and then, of course, there's the second uh, step of how do you do the calculation, which is um, sometimes requires some high school algebra. Sometimes you can do it by writing code. Uh, but it's generally easier to carry out the power analysis once you know what you're looking for than it is to actually decide what you want to be able to detect. Yes, everything is. Um, free and open source and available under a uh, Creative Commons license. End of part one.